October the 1st, right. when the new president came into Mexico, then we saw an immediate response in the marketplace. Our shares moved from drifting around four cents in a fairly short order up to about eight cents on a, on a really good volume. And this is a combination of things. Ken and John, Sonora Gold, how are you gentlemen? Doing very well, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Good day, Andy. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you. And uh, just full disclosure to everybody out there, the first time I spoke to both Ken and uh, John was the first time I met them. I met them at the conference in, in Florida, Sonora Gold. And I did not own the shares in uh, my first meeting with them. I uh, told them that I, well, you go and look at the uh, whole video there, but I was very impressed with them as individuals, primarily with individuals. And then I thought their stock was very undervalued. Since that first discussion in Florida, I have become an investor. I've accumulated on the open market and my family has also started to accumulating on the uh, over the counted market on the open market. So. All that disclosure, I am an investor. Thank you both so much, both for being here, guys. I do appreciate it. Let's um, talk about Sonora Gold and the company. Probably what most attracted me to you guys was you both. That's first with that. So let me get your background again real quickly. John, go ahead. Let's start with you. Certainly, yeah. As, as I said before, Andy, nothing's changed in my background. <laughs> I started banking in the UK. I was recruited by the Royal Bank in Canada. In the mid eighties, I launched uh, a group of small uh, public companies. Uh, most were successful. Um, those which were most notable, one would have been Asia Pacific Resources, where we established uh, 1 billion tons of very high grade potash in Thailand. Um, we developed it to the stage of having a full feasibility study. And then uh, we weren't able to take it to production simply because we were not Thai. So we ended up selling the company to a Thai company. Uh, <laughs> Was about 140 million US. So that was that one. The other company called Crew Development, which became Crew Gold, and one on which we were hoping to develop uh, uh, Sonora Gold is the principle of having early cash flow. So uh, I started that company with a business partner. We acquired then a controlling interest in the South African company called Metarex. Jointly, we uh, acquired the uh, Chibaluma copper mine in Zambia, privately, sir. Then merged with Mindex, a Norwegian company, and uh, opened up first gold mine in Greenland. We had uh, nickel in the Philippines, and really we had uh, ventures around the world. Uh, we had cash flow. We had your projects coming through. It was a really good success. Um, then in 2002, and I decided I was going to step down from uh, uh, crew. It was just taking too much of energy, too much time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I started a geothermal project with Ken. I will mention that um, the metrics went on uh, subsequently, and within about four or five years, it was sold for $1.3 billion. So uh, an outrageous success. So that's really my background. And uh, the emphasis is that it's, uh, I'm not a geologist, I'm not an engineer, but I've been involved in the business for some 45 years. I joined Sonoro at the tail end of 2018. I was invited by Ken to be the chairman. Uh, I took my position through the market, through private placements, acquiring shares, no special deals, that was it. And um, very pleased the way it's been developed. You're yeah, excellent, Kevin. And in my own background, if I may, sorry to interrupt there. They, I've been 40 plus years in the resource sector. Uh, prior to that, uh, I started off to my career as a mechanical engineer and moved into the resource sector in the early 80s into oil and gas. On the, on the management side. And uh, the 1980s were uh, mainly oil and gas, uh, both in the United States and in uh, the Philippines. Uh, we were drilling in the world's first offshore horizontal completion well in the Philippines, uh, offshore of uh, Palawan Island. Uh, our company uh, became quite successful. We took it public, uh, what was then the Vancouver Stock Exchange, and eventually, within a couple of years, it went on to the New York Exchange, where it trades to this day. And in the 90s, uh, I was the, the first foreign mining company to strike a deal with uh, Jacquemin, the state mining enterprise of what was then Zaire and what is now the DRC. 
And so we do, I took that project through, there was a copper cobalt uh, tailings and hard rock project to put it all the way through feasibility. And then uh, in 2002, John and I got together, we established a geothermal energy company, first in Canada, then moved into the United States. And it was very successful where it was, company was taken over in 2009, set up uh, then a, a renewable energy company in the Philippines, privately uh, owned it down a hundred percent and uh, sold that in 2014 and became president and CEO of Sonoro. And that's my sole focus and will remain my sole focus until we have uh, achieved what I consider to be the, the proper uh, result with Sonoro and that's how they go into production. Or alternatively, if, if there's an attractive enough uh, takeover bid, then we'll certainly take a look at that. John, so um, as I mentioned to all of our viewers and listeners, and as I also brought it to my family and uh, my partner who helps run uh, my family's um, different accounts and funds, I bought into you, and just so the viewers know this, is really because of you guys. I was so impressed with both your backgrounds, but even more than that, it was just your... I just really trusted you, so I can't emphasize that enough to my viewers. But really, also the second thing that there's th two other things that really, really attracted me to the stock price in uh, that said the stock I shouldn't say the company is you guys have great value at these levels. Um, so can you, if you would, or John, if you would, can you please talk to me about the valuation here? And uh, where do you think this uh, company is going or where you'd like to get the stock price up to? Getting a stock price is like projecting the weather. Uh, <laughs> so you can't comment on that, but where would you like to see the value? Let's start off by the, uh, my cost is uh, 14, 15 cents a share, as are all the insiders, yes. Um, the share price suffered a lot. Uh, when in 2023, uh, we weren't able to get a mining license. So when I look at the price of the shares, I look at values, etc. we were trading up in the thirties. We didn't get a, a mining license as we had hoped and all our business plans were based on that. And then we saw the, the repercussion as, as shareholders became a little disenchanted and then it started to move down and down. But, uh, one of the four share things we have that, that kind of is that. The assign is we hold 24% of the issued shares. In addition to that, we have 40% of our shares, which are held over in Europe, principally in Germany and Switzerland. Includes a German bank and a Swiss bank. So really wealthy individual people who have followed Ken and me through our various projects. So when people say, why do you have such a large European shareholder base? Very simple. They follow the jockeys and they came in with the earlier projects and they stayed with us faithfully. And one of the things that you would have noticed is that uh, October the 1st, when the new president came into Mexico, then we saw an immediate response in the marketplace. Our shares moved from drifting around four cents in a fairly short order up to about eight cents on a, on a really good volume. And this is a combination of things. One is the new release which came out from the uh, Mexican government or lack of common Mexican government. And I think I'll make a, a, a statement here, which is, is so true, is the media, as we know in politics and the business, creates the images out there. And when it was put forward by the former president, a proposal to ban open pit mining, the headline everywhere was Mexico bans open pit mining. The natural nature of reaction by everybody, it would appear, was it's over. It's over, it's over. And yes. therefore, nothing happened. So our right. stock suffered a lot, as did a lot of uh, companies said. But when reality set in and the new president came in, and banning open pit mining was no longer even whispered, the response was very positive, again, to all the, to all the companies. So to get to where we see we would like to be, etc. And I can't predict the share price, but if we look at the fact that the insiders hold a substantial position, we have very strong Europeans. Ken and I were over in Sweden at the tail end of September, and they've now become good supporters of ours. Again, the psychology, if I may say this, is when we've spoken to Europeans, we give the project. It's usually, is this a three 
or a five-year project deeply in Europe and buying into this company because they see the long-term development and the long-term future of it. There are some traders, and that's healthy to have that. But yeah. people look at that and say, what is the real value there? So when I try to get to your question and answer it, which is where do we see it going? I see the Sonora share price reflecting the value of the project. Now, the value of the project, um, I believe uh, when we did our PEA, it was on $1,800 an ounce. When it was reviewed at $2,000 an ounce, I think the uh, net present value was about $116 million. That's on uh, $2,000 an ounce. $2,600 an ounce. It doesn't take uh, a mathematician to calculate what the value may be. So let's say hypothetically, uh, it's over 200 million. It's moved up. Okay. Take our shares being issued out there, 200 million shares approximately. Market cap now we have probably about 12 million Canadian or US maybe. There's a huge gap between the two. So if all things go well and we move forward in the way we anticipate and the money license is granted in a reasonable time, we would expect the share price to move towards the net present value. So I'd like to clarify a little bit, Andy, on the, on the permitting issue. If you, I, so I wanted to go to you next, Ken, absolutely. But let me just comment on what John said. And I want, you were next, I wanted to go to you. So I, to all of our listeners and viewers out there, I did this exercise and thank you so much for you answered them very eloquently, properly. I went back before I bought any shares. And again, I am an investor and my partner and I looked back at the chart. It was 2023. I want to say I'm going from memory. Just looking at the chart, you took a dump. And I said, right there is when bad news came out or the market's perception of this came out. And I was like, that's probably where they didn't get their, uh, their permit. Mm -hmm. Now, when I met with you in Florida and I first cut that video, and I want you to go to you next, Ken. Ken was telling me how he is very optimistic with the new political change in Mexico, that a permit would be forthcoming. So, Ken... Please tell me about the permitting process, where you're at, and what your expectations are. Certainly. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Well, back in 2022, we submitted the environmental impact statement to the Semernat, the environmental agency. We went through the entire process, question and answers, question and answers, responded to every single one. And the expectation was we would get the approval for the building the mine by the end of 2022. Okay. Unbeknownst to us at the time, under President Lopez Obrador, the, the stage had been set for a future potential ban on open pit mining. Uh, and so we ended up in a situation where we're not getting any response from the environmental agency. And we spent the past two years effectively in a, in a, in a holding pattern waiting for the approval, which never arrived. And then, of course, uh, in the past year, over 2024, that noise grew louder about the potential ban on open pit mining. But that was a political ploy in order to get the support of the green parties in the, in the Mexican election, which occurred in, on June the 2nd of this year. And now the, the new president, President Scheinbaum, was actually in, was inaugurated on October the 1st. Now she's very pragmatic. She put our team of people around her and ministers around her that uh, we believe are much more pragmatic than the previous administration. And as a result, uh, the one issue that we are really, really thrilled about is the fact that the potential ban on open pit mining is no longer an issue. It has been removed from the 100-point pledge that uh, the previous government had uh, put to the Mexican people. So it's gone. We believe it's still going to be resurrected in that regard. Now, some of the concrete uh, issues that uh, President Scheinbaum has initiated in the short period of time, the four weeks since she became president, is she's uh, br brought to over 200 uh, CEOs 
uh, from the U.S. Mexico Forum into into the uh, the palace in Mexico City and inform them all that your investments are safe in Mexico. Now, she has expressed that same statement over and over again to foreign delegations and, and domestic delegations in, in Mexico. So we take her at her word. The other thing is, well, she's established a commission where, which is represented by people in the senior echelons of government and the mining industry in Mexico. And they're in a dialogue as we speak. They're in a dialogue which to outlining it the concerns that each side has in order to you know, ensure that mining in Mexico will continue to support both the government's directions and the, the mining industry as well. So we, we feel that it's very, very important for us. And now as we go forward, we believe that, I don't believe we'll get the approval by the end of the year because that, things don't happen that quickly in government circles. But I believe in the first half of 2025, that we will be able to get the approval to build the mine. And so we're working feverishly to achieve that. So that will be the, the focus for us over the coming months. So Ken, when I met you in Florida, that was the really the, the biggest reason I saw besides both of you two and the trust that I developed with you two was that, okay, that was the reason why the stock fell and made it such a great value. And the reason why, and this is me talking as an investor, there has to be a, some kind of conduit that makes something go up. There you go. That's what it would be. And so I'm very, very optimistic. And yeah, very, a very astute observation on your part. And it's the actual truth. Yeah. And I am saying this again, I... So for, let me reiterate, I do have skin in this game now. And this is what I told my family members that have skin in the game now as well, as well as a partner. This would be the, uh, the lever, if you would, to spring things higher. Now, that being said, as John said, stock prices are impossible to predict with certainty as well as, but you do need certain things to happen. And that's why I became an investor. So John, another thing that really impressed me with you Tell me about the financing you and Ken gave or the insiders gave to the company to get Sonora through this hub and the terms that, about that loan that you gave. And uh, if you could tell, I know it, but tell the viewers about that because I was so impressed with that. What happened with that? Okay. Andy, we believe in absolute transparency and, and honesty uh, with our shareholders and uh, what you've raised is the fact that we, the insiders, have provided loans. I think it might be up to about three point eight million US dollars now, unsecured, no terms of repayment. In my chairman's letter, which is on our website, I state that it's not our intention to convert these to shares. But we look to get them repaid when we go to production or from financing. But I think it's important Andy, to understand why of those shares? Was that a result of poor management? Did we screw up? Where did we go wrong, et cetera? And I have uh, reference to you before, and we like to say this to uh, people who are seriously interested in their company. We truly believe we have the central components to be a successful company. The people, the project, the share structure, the business plan, and access to funding. And I can deal with those separately, but in this particular case, in 2022, we yes. secured a commitment for project financing. Our drilling had been completed. And an important fact is we stopped drilling simply because we said we have enough to go to production and we will develop the, the mine, the full potential from cash flow. So yes. instead of doing what most units do, which is drill, 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 baby, we just said, no, we stop. We, we've got what we need. We have, the, we have a project financing. We have a business plan. We have uh, a mining engineer who's built mines in the past. We have a geologist who's second to none. So we are ready to go. 2022, we got the debt sorted out. We're ready to go. And of course, business plans are critical for us. In fact, any business, your listeners out there, whether it's a mining company or whether it's a grocery store, have a business plan. If you don't, you're sure to fail. So in our business plan, we had already calculated and worked with our project lender that the property payments would come under the financing. Mm -hmm. 
Hence, when there was no financing, we said, okay, guys, we'll put up the money. And why do we do that? To preserve the property. Because without the property, you've got nothing. And we didn't think it was equitable to go to the shareholders and say, oh, by the way, we need another three and a half million US just to pay property payments. So we made a conscientious decision for what we believe is in the best interest of the shareholders, which includes us and everybody out there, um, to put up the money, preserve the property, not have any unnecessary dilution, and to be able to convince people and say, look, nobody can predict certain things. We, we didn't predict the price of gold. We didn't predict what was going to happen in Mexico. But what we are as a group, and I think this is where it gets to the team, which I'd like to talk about a bit in a moment, is we're totally committed to this. As Ken said, this is his only project. It's my only project. It's yeah. only the only project of Mel Herdrick and Holy Gears. We've come together as a team and we're commercial. We've been in the business for 25, 35, 40 years. We didn't have to do this. But we saw this as a great opportunity to be a successful operation. So we've come together, committed to this project, own shares, and we put up money. And that's to give our shareholders that confidence. Hey, you don't have to worry that the market's crapping. Bide your time. And our German shareholders, the European shareholders who know us best, understand we'll do that, that we'll always stand behind it. So what I say to you, Andy, as being a new shareholder, Look at that document, which is called Why Sonora Gold, Mexico's Next Union of Money Company, and why it's distinctive. And that answers then not just your questions to about the loans we put up, but as to what makes Sonora different from the other junior companies that are right there. Yeah. No, thank you for saying that. Ken, I want to get to you in one second um, a question about production. But John, if I can just answer this, I had a question about the team. Do you have, do you have people on the board or on the team that are helping to navigate? And what I'm trying to get at is they're Mexican. Do you have Mexicans on the board or on the team that helps now navigate this political situation? I think it's best for Ken to answer that because, because Ken handles the Mexican situation with our mining engineers and geologists. Ken Henning over to please come to he's, he's the best guy to respond. By all means, uh, the mining engineer Harvey Diaz is on the board of directors. And uh, Harvey has you know, 50 years' experience in building mines in Mexico. And so some of the notable mines you will recognize the names El Castillo, Malapos, La Colorada, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> Jorge has been around a long, long time. And our, Mel Herdrick is not on the board, but he is our VP of exploration in Mexico. So between those two, we are well represented as far as a, a history in Mexico and B access to uh, the polit political scene in Mexico as well. So I would say at this point in time that um, we're, we're as current uh, as far as the relationships in Mexico as any of our peers in Mexico. Excellent. And that was literally a question I had from my family is who from Mexico is on the board or has experience navigating all of this so answered that. Ken, this, this question is to you, assuming you get permitted, and these are all assumptions, but you get permitted when you think you will sometime in the first half of 25, what's an ETA on when you can go into production after you get permitted? I would say, yeah, from the time we get the permit in our hands until uh, we pour the first dory bar is a very conservative 12 month period. And uh, just to let you know, and you know, Jorge Diaz has, has built mines in a much, much faster period of time than that to uh, open pit mines because they, they, open pit mines are quite easy to, to construct. There's no major, uh, engineering involved. It's, uh, it's a case up and open pit, you clear. You get rid of the strip to start the mining. You harden the roads to accommodate the big trucks, and you you build a leach pad. And uh, surrounding the leach pad, of course, would be where the crusher is and the and the ADR plant to produce the Dore bar. So there's not a lot of uh, of infrastructure involved whatsoever. So 12 month period is is quite reasonable, and I think we can do it for less period of time than that. 
Now, what we are also focused on is the, we go back to 2018 when we acquired the project in the first place. We made a conscious decision at that time to, to, to explore the near surface material that uh, was evident to us through earlier drilling that had taken place. And we figured that uh, in order to get into production early, we should uh, consider drilling enough material to enable us to start the production at a, at a reasonably smaller rate and then build up uh, the production at rate out of cash flow. And that's, the, that's what we implemented. So we drilled a total of 55,000 meters of drilling already accomplished which gives us uh, uh, 440,000 ounces within the pit shells, according to SRK, and a further almost 300,000 ounces surrounding the pit shells that have been drilled, but are not classified yet because the drill spacing is not tight enough. So when you take that into account, uh, we put together a, a mine plan that gives us uh, a 90-year life of mine. So on the basis of uh, 14,000 tons per day throughput, that gives us 33,000 ounces a year. And as John alluded to earlier about the net present value at $2,000 gold, well, it, gold is now at uh, almost $2,800. So there's a, a big difference in the value of the, of the PEA uh, based upon what we did a year ago in October of 2000, uh, 2023 to what it is today. And that's not reflected in, in, in the values uh, of the, of the, the uh, the PEA, and it's not reflected, of course, in the value in, in the market capitalization of the company. So I, I would say sometime in the, in the next year, I think it would be beneficial for us to produce another PEA or brief feasibility if, if we need to go in that direction. But the, the, the goal is um, we have uh, enough material right now based upon the 30% of the project that of the, of the mineralized zones in the project that have been drilled and assayed to date gives us yeah, just under half a million ounces in the pit shells and uh, potentially, like I mentioned, up to 300,000 ounces surrounding the pit shells. But also when we go into drilling the other 70% of the known mineralized zones, and these are known because we sampled them at surface, then uh, I think the, the, the projection that we're looking for is a potential for the project of up to 2 million ounces. And it behooves us then to take that cash flow from operations um, from, from production and then convert that into additional drilling. Additional drilling should uh, enable us then to get to our ulti ultimate uh, destination, which, like I mentioned, is a potential for up to 2 million ounces. That's great. And uh, I would agree to you that was one of the reasons that was you made you very attractive to me as an investor is this was all done at below 2000 spot price and look where we're at today and i believe we're going much higher that just gives me as an investor a lot of leverage so again that's just just another reason um gentlemen uh we're going to wrap up here uh i'd like to have you on in the next couple of weeks next week or two but is there anything you'd like to share with uh, the viewers or listeners here um, Yeah, that you'd like to share about yourself or the company or what they can expect if there's anything to expect it over the next few weeks? I'll speak first. I think um, what we'd really like the listeners to understand is that we are a business. We're commercially oriented. This is not a charity. This is a well thought through business plan. We've stuck with the business plan. Circumstances arise, all money comes to have it when you need to be prepared. And we think that we are prepared and we are capable to go through. So unlike a lot of juniors, we have those five essential components to make it work. I think there's another part, which is very important is we're very aware in the community from past experiences, et cetera, mining companies or, or artistry or whatever it is, they, they come and they go. The idea is that you have to work with the community and you have to understand what they need. Don't tell them what they need, find out what they need and then work with the community. And most communities want to have sustainability. They want their environment to be taken care of. And they want to know that at the end of the day, when the mine is finished, what happens? So we work very closely with the community. We have the support of the local people, the governor, etc. And so we really do have 
what's now become a common phrase about you should show environmental or social responsibility, etc. That's been our life in everything we've done within the business, outside the business. We want the community to be a part of the company. They want us there. We want them there. So we say, not only do we have all the virtues that you that we've tried to explain about Sonoro and to why you should feel comfortable, but we go beyond that. We step into the areas where um, companies are often forced to go, but we do it voluntarily. Yeah, John, I think, well, I know that. I just want to thank you so much for saying that. We're going to do a story on you about exactly that, what you and Ken have been doing, or I should say what you've done in the past and what you and Ken are doing in the local community, because that does not get enough press, if you would. It's always overlooked and never talked about, but it has probably the biggest impact to the people, the people of the local community, and that's what we should really be caring about. So with that, I think we'll end, but I do, I, I am so grateful for both of you being actively and caring for the local community there. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Let's give real quick, uh, your website is, the website is said, uh, sonoragold.com s-o-n-o-r-o gold.com and the symbol on the TSX Venture Exchange is s-g-o or s-g-o dot v as the case may be we're also trading on the OTCQB and uh, that is under the symbol s-m-o-f-f Excellent. I will link to all of this in the show notes uh, below this interview. Again, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for uh, for uh, joining me. It's a pleasure to see you again, Andy. Thank you very much, Andy. Look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. Pleasure is mine.